Today, I want to ask the question, can green and growth really go together? It's a simple question. I want to explain why I believe that they can and indeed they have to. I want to share my vision of green growth for Europe and also for your green island. When I became European Commissioner for Environment nearly three years ago, I took a conscious decision to make resource efficiency the core and guiding principle of my mandate. It was a shift in emphasis designed to put environmental policy fairly and squarely at the center of our policy agenda on the desks of the ministers for economy, agriculture, energy, transport, and indeed also prime ministers, not only my colleagues, environmental ministers. The logic went like this. Modern environment policy is not an obstacle to economic growth or a constraint on business. It is not about only using legislation to punish polluters once the damage has been done. On the contrary, our future growth and competitiveness will fundamentally depend on our ability to respond to the challenges of resource scarcity and environmental degradation. These challenges will inevitably put a break on growth unless we tackle them now. We have to get ready for a world of 9 billion people by 2050, a world where on the business as usual scenario, we will need three times more material resources by that time and 70% more food, feed and fiber. The days of growth based on intensive use of cheaper and cheaper resources are over. The commodity price reductions of the last century were already wiped out in the first decade of this century. Competition for resources among nations and economic actors is increasing. They constitute a high and increasing proportion of the input costs for business. And for many of these resources, Europe is highly dependent on imports. In this context, the economic and business logic for moving from resource intensive to resource efficient production, it's clear. In fact, it is also clear that we do not really have a choice. The writing is simply on the wall. The choice we do have is whether we prepare for a managed transition now through smart investment, innovation, or whether we continue with the business as usual scenario and wait for supply shocks to bite with the disruptive consequences that will surely came. By putting resource efficiency at the heart of the European structural economic policy, the European Commission has chosen the first option. The resource efficiency flagship of the Europe 2020 strategy says that we will still have the possibility of growth in the face of those global trends, but only if we can decouple that growth from our use of resources and the impacts of that use. We have since adopted a number of long-term strategies under the flagship, which put environment at the center of policies in the fields of energy transport, research policies, industrial cohesion and agricultural policies, climate and biodiversity policies. We adopted a comprehensive framework for action last year in the roadmap to a resource efficient Europe, guided by a 2050 vision, milestones to be reached by 2020, and shorter term actions both at the EU and also member states levels. This year, European Union heads of state and government called for the rapid implementation of the EU resource efficiency and low carbon roadmaps in the conclusions of the Spring European Council on Economic Governance. Of course, we take this task seriously. To start with, we have brought together the right people to guide the process under the chairmanship of your former Taoiseach, John Britton. We united environmental leaders and academics business leaders and financials, ministers, the commissioners in the European Resource Efficiency Platform, the platform already preparing its recommendations on promoting a circular economy, on providing the right conditions for investment, and on that indicators we need to measure our progress on resource efficiency, also on targets. We are making sure we align our financial resources to the task in hand by, integrating resource efficiency and greening into 
mainstreaming for cohesion and agriculture in our budget proposal by 2020, up to 2020, by proposing a 60% of earmarking of research funding for sustainability and climate change, and by proposing a 50% budget increase also for the Life Plus. So what can you expect in the next month and years? What resources will we be tackling and how? I can give you some of concrete examples. Last week we adopted proposals in respect of one of the most undervalued resources, water. We have made progress on water quality in Europe over the past decades, but we still have a problem both in terms of quality and quantity of water. Our new blueprint to safeguard Europe's water resources says that to reach our objective of good water status by 2015, we need better implementation of legislation, yes, but we also need to consider water in other policies such as agriculture, fisheries, transport, energy, and we need to invest. We need to improve water efficiency and to maintain our edge in innovative approaches to water management and use. The water blueprint proposes water balances and accounts for all river basins as the basis for water efficiency targets to be set by the member states. European Union standards for water reuse. Improved efficiency of water using devices in buildings through eco design. And better implementation of the polluter paste principle, in particular in agriculture, through metering, irrigation efficiency, water pricing, and better economic analysis. One of our greatest achievements in the European Union is, of course, a single market. And early next year, I intend show how we can use its potential to boost supply and demand for more green goods and services. And also to encourage companies to improve their environmental performance and reduce resource use. Both business and consumers are asking us for tools to be able to recognize the genuine green products and companies on the market. We are already developing common environmental footprinting methods to calculate the sustainability of products and organizations based on life cycle assessment. Creating a single market for green products and services based on these tools will not only cut costs for business and provide them with a legal, uh, sorry, with a level playing field, it will also help consumers understand environmental claims and make informed choices. Eco design and energy labeling are key in this respect, and I will be working during the next two years on developing approaches to integrating material efficiency and water efficiency into eco design for the products categories where we identify the highest potential benefits ensuring durability, water efficiency, and recyclability. Here the story is pretty simple. So you have, when you design the product, you have to think how you design the product, that you use less energy, less water, that the product is recycled and so on. When the product is manufactured and if it's not done in proper way, then already you have the problem. Also next year, we will publish two communications tackling sustainability in two of the three areas we identified in our roadmap as having the greatest impact on resource use. This is food and buildings. In both of these, we will take a holistic approach, addressing the key resources and the potential for efficiency gains along the whole value chain, from production, processing and distribution to use, reuse, recycling, and finally disposal. And in 2014, we will review our targets in waste legislation, updating them to the level to, of the ambition we need to reach the milestones we have set for resource efficiency. In the roadmap, we called for the virtual elimination of landfilling by 2020. Five member states have already shown that this is possible, but we still have 10 member states that bury more than 70% of their municipal waste in holes in the ground. This is not just a waste of resources, it is clearly a missed opportunity also for the jobs. Eliminating such landfilling and meeting higher recycling rates could create 130,000 jobs in Europe and generate 15 billion euro turnover for the waste sector only. 
implementing all our waste legislation would, according to our models, create 400,000 jobs, save 72 billion euro a year, and decrease the annual turnover of the European Union waste management and recycling sector by 42 billion euro. For Ireland, that would mean several thousand jobs, 600 million euro extra turnover. Incidentally, it would also reduce total direct and indirect greenhouse gas emissions by around 3 to 5 percent, which all in all, it's not bad. So we have done a lot, and we have a clear set of actions for the next two years. But will this be enough to take us to our ultimate objective of decoupling growth from resource use and its environmental impacts? After all, we are all talking about a very fundamental transition from a growth model based on intensive use of cheap resources to one based on getting more value from expensive resources. I believe that we have three particular challenges that we must face if we are to deliver the, that transition. We must mobilize at the national level, we must invest and innovate, and we must create a circular economy. First, national governments have to play their role. Most of the relevant policy tools are not in Brussels. They are in 27 national capitals. We are trying to help the capitals go in the same direction. We have started to integrate resource efficiency into the governance mechanisms of the Europe 2020, the European semester, encouraging member states to include resource efficiency in their national reform programs. This year, using this mechanism, we rec recommended that 12 member states should shift taxation from labor to pollution and environmental degradation. We also made extensive recommendations on energy efficiency and transport, and we will continue to push for phasing out especially environmentally harmful subsidies. But we need to use this governance system to drive further environmental improvements, for example, to exploit the growth and jobs potential in waste and water management or when we talk about green public procurement. Ireland was not asked to provide an update to its national reform program this year, but we appreciate your efforts to continue monitoring and acting on the wider range of Europe 2020 commitments. The move towards a resource-efficient economy and society underpins the success in the fields of energy, climate change, but also research and development and employment. The priority that Ireland is giving to targeting research and innovation demonstrates very well the thinking that future competitiveness and sustainability should simply go hand in hand. That brings me to the second challenge, which is investment. I'm by some considered uh, as being techno-optimist, but although I have great hope in technological progress to deal with the pressures on our planet, I know that technology cannot provide all the answers. In reality, I'm more of an innovation optimist for its innovation through the application of existing and new technologies through new business and market systems, new behavior, and through design that has possibility to break us out of the locked-in ways, to move us onto a different growth paradigm shift. It will be the private sector that drives these improvements. Just as we saw it drive up labor productivity in response to rising labor costs in the last century, so it will respond to drive up resource productivity in this century. Unfortunately, I don't think that the warnings of an enlightened few will do enough to persuade a critical mass of economic actors to invest in resource efficiency. That is why we need to work at the macro level to provide the right incentives, to get the prices right, and to use the public, inst to public instruments to leverage also the private investment. In addition to the European programs I already mentioned, I hope that the recent increase in the European Investment Bank capital, EIB capital, will help leverage up to 60 billion euros for resource efficiency projects over the coming three to four years. Our challenge is to mobilize the investment to make that innovation happen on a big enough scale to really make a difference. 
That means not just the small but important leverage effect of public money. It needs private investment. I will be launching a roundtable of investors early next year to look at how we can address the obstacles of public and private investment in resource efficiency. Encouraging investment in areas with highest potential for our future competitiveness is the logic behind the revised industrial policy that Commission adopted a few weeks ago, and we put the circular economy and resource efficiency at the heart of it. The third challenge is that resource efficiency alone, getting more value from fewer resources, will not be enough. McKinsey has estimated that the key improvements in resource efficiency it identified would provide for about 30% of the increased demand we can expect by 2030. So it is clear that we need more than just increases in resource productivity. We must also use those same resources again and again and again. That means moving away from a linear economy, extraction, production, use and throwing away to a circular or closed loop economy, where once a product's life is over, those resources are pumped back into the economy. This means designing for recyclability, repair and reuse, developing new business models, better markets for secondary raw materials and sustainable sourcing, and putting in place industrial symbiosis systems, like your own small resource exchange. All that brings me on to talk about Ireland. Ireland is known as a green island, maybe not so much for its environmentalism, even if strong and existing, as for its farming. So I should say a few words on how I see environmental and agricultural policy policies really working together. Greening the common agricultural policy means recognizing more clearly the value of ecosystem services and also public goods. One of the more relevant greening requirements for the vast majority of Irish farmers will be to protect permanent pastures. They contribute to water protection, the retention of soil carbon, and in many instances, rich biodiversity besides providing the main feed source for cattle and sheep in Ireland. We want to ask the farmers that CAP supports to contribute to the delivery of these goods in their daily work. This work should be valued. And I also believe that continued public support for farming subsidies will in future a lot depend on farmers fulfilling that role also. We wish to bring both water and pesticides legislation under the remit of cross-compliance. Yes, we need to ensure that farmers know their legal obligations, but it makes no sense to support with public money the economic activities that cause the damage and then to use more taxpayers' money to clean up the resulting pollution. It's much more intelligent to use the money for double purposes. I should say that over recent years, notably on nitrates, Ireland has made a real, real progress based on a solid action program with significant efforts by the state and by the farmers alike and with the help of cross-compliance also. Good news for all, no reduction in agricultural output, less pollution, and lower costs for taxpayers. I trust that you will guard this environmental progress jealously, even if the sector expands with the abolition of the milk quotas in 2015. Before I take some of your questions, let me add something about coming next six months. As you might be aware, as you are aware, Ireland will take over the European Union presidency in six weeks. So where I'm looking for input and support from that presidency in putting in place the kind of approach that I have just explained. What are going to be the big dossiers for the Irish in the environmental and resource efficiency fields? One eagerly awaited proposal which will be very much on the table is the new European Environmental Action Program. It will come there is no surprise to you, after what I have said today, that its key message will be that it makes good economic sense to tackle environmental problems, improve resource efficiency, invest in natural capital, 
and reduce environmental related health impacts. The action program will propose provides for the creation of the right conditions for a single market for sustainable and low carbon growth, the strengthening of the European Union's ecological and climate resilience, and the contribution of environmental policy to better human health and well being, and better implementation of legislation and the international dimension of environmental policy. I know that your government is very keen to help secure a first reading agreement on the EIP and, of course, we fully support that. Other key environmental initiatives in our work program for 2013 include, first, early next year we will come forward with proposals to set out the European Union follow-up to sustainable development goals and to the Rio Plus 20 conference. Second, we will review our air quality policies. Despite major improvements, about a third of Europe's city dwellers are still exposed to poor air quality harmful to their health. And progress here will also bring job opportunities and reduced energy use. Third, we plan to come forward with a framework for exploration and exploitation of unconventional fossil fuels, in particular shale gas. While shale gas offers great opportunities, it also poses new challenges to the environment and to the people. We need to ensure clear, transparent rules from the outset. And tomorrow, in Strasbourg, I will be explaining to the European Parliament, together with my colleague, Commissioner Ottinger, who is also in charge for the energy part, how we plan to tackle this. Another area where the Irish have particular experience is in dealing with plastic bags. Plastic bags become litter far too easily and, are too often, and too often end up in the sea. By imposing a small levy, Ireland successfully reduced its consumption by around 95%. Several other member states are developing their own initiatives. We are now looking into the different policy options available for Europe to engage in a concerted effort against the wasteful consumption of plastic bags. I'm confident that the Irish Presidency will be a strong ally in keeping up the momentum on environmental policy. Resource efficiency, green growth and jobs for the EU are essential objectives that we can only achieve if we all pull together. Ladies and gentlemen, it is hard to find a politician who was re-elected for defending longer-term interests over short-term benefits or a manager who was rewarded because the profits of the company were lower but more sustainable in the longer term. Long-term thinking is not often rewarded in business and politics, and this is particularly true in today's economic climate. But to those entrepreneurs and politicians that are looking more to tomorrow than 2020, I would just point out that employment in the green sectors in the European Union has been growing by 3% a year during the crisis. The global market for eco-industries is estimated to be at least a trillion euros and is expected to almost double over the next 10 years. We have to do away with the thinking that makes a zero-sum game of our present and of our future. It is those fast-growing green sectors that will be the enablers for us to green the whole economy in the future, and green growth begins tomorrow, not in 2020. Let me finish again by quoting my good friend Akim Steiner, his executive director of United Nations Environmental Programme, when he commented some of Rio Plus 20 outcomes connected to the green economy, green growth. We have failed to turn things around in the past 20 years. But underneath that failure, there is an extraordinary array of activity and innovation. The heart of that is green economics. Rather than fighting the power of capital or trying to legislate away its environmental downsides, the idea is to harness market forces to turn economies onto a sustainable track, economic, social, environmental. 20 years ago, we agreed what to do. Now we have the tools to do it. 
if we do not go into the heart of economic policy. We will meet here at Rio plus 40, even more culpable. Markets are not are so, markets are social constructs. They are not a force like gravity. They can be governed and they should be governed. So instead of trying to prove that environment is hampering competitiveness ability of our economy, we should rather use our energy and focus innovation potential to deliver the necessary answers. There is no alternative to sustainability and by the way, we all know that. In Irish case, that means that the famous 40 shades of green would need to get another one that's the green economy. Thank you.